Okay, hello guys. Um, we are back for a Timor criminal experience. This one would be uh, aiming at a thread that I wanted to do last year. Um, I made a three-part thread about the prospects of the uh, Russian operation um, last year between November and December. The third part was quite a riot. Um, but now we have to focus on something a lot more palpable. Before we projected ourselves in the future and we said Pokrov, it was 47 kilometers uh, from the positions in November and it looked like an eternity. You guys might pretty much remember how bad it was uh, the slugfest initially in Avdivka and nobody would think uh, that Pokrovsk was a target within this year, uh, especially somewhere around um, March, uh, April, just before Ocheretino, of course. But even after Ocheretino, there were moments when everybody thought, okay, the Russians are going to peak and we're going to push over. One of those moments uh, was, of course, uh, the attempt from the RDK to um, attack in March. Uh, the Russian territory turned out to be an absolute shit show. And then a second moment was this encroachment, uh, continued encroachment on Krinky, and of course the campaigns of uh, deep strikes uh, at the line, but also behind from the Ukrainian side. Well, we are officially, depending on who you listen, uh, between 7.4 kilometers from Pokrovsk and 9.8 which still is an absolutely large amount of ground to cover. However, the Russians are already a lot closer to Mirnograd, which would be the perfect link. Once you are at Mirnograd, you take the city, then you flank uh, Pokros from the east, and then you uh, have to deal with the city itself. I will make a tactical threat. It will not be um, a part of... Uh, space i will do some maps uh, of course those would be uh, the result of discussions we have within the group um, i would once again like to repeat i might be the aggregator of our opinions but it's not only me um the bunch is quite funny uh, at the moment we're having a lot of fun because we feel that we got this. Maybe it's not 100% true in the sense that right now the Ukrainians seem absolutely predictable uh, despite course, but at some point we will uh, probably have to, you know, make um, a balance of how we, you know, uh, predicted things, how we saw things and how, what happened. Um, but in this case, what I want to tell you is that is basically what we have discussed about with, with the other guys. And I need to tell you that um, there are members, everyone actually, that are contributing in such a way you cannot see. It, but they are giving us and me, especially, the tools to have this um, view on the conflict. And I don't know if you guys noticed in comparison to other people who do the analysis, I'm not going to name them. Uh, we tend to be a lot more um, accepting of the fact that it's going to be a shit show uh, losses-wise uh, and also uh, grind-wise. Why? Because I think the team, the group has understood that there are uh, problems, hurdles and limitations to the Russian army uh, that the Russian army doesn't want to have, actually, but it's simply because it's not fighting against the Ukrainians alone. Anyway, that's uh, for another day. Today we're going to speak about Pokrovsk, as I said, because uh, the city itself presents uh, a formidable challenge if you want to take it, unless it's not well defended. That's why the, the main point for me, as I said, would be to first uh, push as much as possible on its flanks. Uh, but in this case, it would be uh, on the eastern flank, so go north, Mirnograd going to Ardobropila, which would lock the Ukrainians uh, in the area and they would force them to go all over the place to go and uh, resupply Kramatorsk and all the area around it, because that's the funny part. <coughs> uh, 
given that the Ukrainians have a um, logistic train that is fully uh, road driven, they have trains, that's not the problem, but most of their main logistics are still road driven. They have access to roads, the roads are whatever, but it, it allows them to go fast enough. This is especially visible when they use their high marches. You see them driving as trucks, always trucks are not too far from a highway so they can get on. It is the same for the supply lines as well. So basically the point for the Russians would be to absolutely choke um, the supply both upstream and downstream. Downstream for uh, Pokrovsk and upstream towards uh, both sides, so defending Zaporozhye and defending uh, the northern, northwestern part of uh, the uh, Donetsk Oblast. Therefore, the, the main point, and we're seeing it, what's going on, especially with the capture of Karlovka and the push towards Ukraine, the Russians are trying to establish three main things. The first thing is uh, have a, a far less congested highway from Donetsk to Cheretino towards the target that you are. The Russians right now want to absolutely have multiple um, driveways towards their front. And if you see more or less um, the map, I'm going to post one just so you can uh, check it. Uh, this is the current attempt by the Russians. The red lines are the main ways. And you can see that one of the things that happened recently by taking over memory is that the highway that's going from uh, underneath Avdivka towards Pokrovsk, so the uh, E50 around Selidovo, <coughs> is secured to a point that the Russians can bring their reinforcements as close as possible to the fight right now. But with the complete clearance of uh, northern Kurakovo and down to Ugledar, then they're going to have access to actually three highways. As I said, you're going to have the main highway from the... Um, from Donetsk uh, towards um, Konstantinovka, the highway that goes from Donetsk towards Pokrovsk, and then the highway that goes through Marinka. If you see the, uh, I think I posted it, guys. So, uh huh. So it's there. You can see that the highways also represent perfect areas of uh, both. Responsibilities for the uh, groups that are uh, evolving in, in the general area of operations, but also they represent the main goal of this operation towards Pokrovsk. Pokrovsk is so much important for the Ukrainians and the Russians in this case, mainly because it has the higher density of the next two oblasts. So in order to get, if you get Pokrovsk, you can go north, south, east, west. It also gives a rather quick access to the Dnipropetrovsk Oblast, which would, as you know, escalate the problem for the Ukrainians and also escalate the Russian march towards Ukraine. So far, the Russians have declared annexed four uh, oblasts and one autonomous republic, autonomous republic of Crimea, already gone through a uh, annexation process done within a legal frame. In this case, it was a referendum. They, they held Crimea. Um, the majority of the population voted. We can discuss about the legality and legitimacy of that, but it, don't, it doesn't really matter. You had people in Crimea voting, and that was it. For the other four oblasts, which is Lugansk Oblast, uh, Donetsk Oblast, Zaporozhye Oblast, and Kherson Oblast, you have a huge problem. First of all, only the Lugansk Oblast is more or less fully taken under control. Lugansk Oblast is between 98 point something and 99.1% 90, control. <coughs> there is still the problem up uh, north. It needs to be solved. It's going to be solved at some point. But for the moment, um, it is what it is. Let's, let's say it's, there is still a, a little speck. The most pressing issue we are seeing is Donetsk Oblast. Donetsk Oblast is only controlled roughly at 60 to 63%, depending on how you look at the oblast. So there is a lot of job to be done, but with Pokrovs, it's going to go a lot faster. It's going to go a lot faster because instead of having this bullshit of maneuver warfare that everybody's selling, you, we are working with a constriction strategy, so basically an attrition 
warfare. And Christian warfare is not just sending guys <coughs> to uh, get slaughtered or kill the other guy. It's not destroying a maximum and, and grinding down the other structure. And Christian warfare is also making sure that the other guy does not have the uh, necessary equipment and supply lines to, to basically stage a fight. And in this case, taking over poker, it's exactly that. Uh, you are making it more complicated for the garrison around the uh, Kramatorsk, Druskovka, uh, Slavyansen, uh, Konstantinovka area to resupply themselves, not because they are in some way uh, attacked or uh, under fire control. No, it's simply because instead of going straight from Pokrovsk, and as I said, it's about 90 kilometers, now if you don't lose the Dobropila, you're going to have to, run, to, to go around about 140 to 150 kilometers. It's not too bad, you know, it, you can still do it. But the Dobropila would be within fire control as well. Given if you have Mirnograd, you just take a ruler, go to Google Maps, you can see it's, I think it's between um, 12 and 40 kilometers. Not very complicated to, to understand the point, but <coughs> if you take the Dobropila, then the next bypass, it's going to force the Ukrainians to go between 210 if they cut uh, through two highways over uh, Dnipropetrovsk Blast and passing uh, by the uh, Dnipropetrovsk Blast towards uh, the Kharkov Blast and then uh, going to the junction in uh, Donetsk Blast. Or if that doesn't work, this cutout between two highways, they're going to go all over, which is between 250 and 220 kilometers, depending how the Ukrainians are going to move up. However, the problem with this is that when you look at the map, and this is the most important part that a lot of people need to actually, uh, you know, do better when they explain this. When you look at the map, uh, right now the Russians are in the area of Terni. And this is something I explained to people for a lot of time, but everybody was like, what are they doing at Terni? What are they trying to have it? And I said, it's very simple. You need to start to establish your positions in Terni and Polivka because once you are there, first of all, you have this um, natural obstacle in front of you. But if you are there and you, you see Zarishne, Torske and so on, in order for the people to give supplies, to get supplies through uh, towards Kamatorsk from the highway behind it, it's about 50 kilometers. Now, it's agreed that we don't have FPVs or um, tube artillery that fires that far. But you have something different, which is you have Iskanders and you have, you guessed it, UMPKs. The problem, once you go there and you start interdicting uh, the passage from Slavyansk, uh, towards Mikhailovka, is that by setting your shop there, so basically you are in Zarishne, and start cleaning up, you are making a kind of, a kind of, of course, kind of hotel. It's extremely large. It's, it's roughly about 33, 35 kilometers. And it regards, of course, the severest area. But the most problematic point for the um, Ukrainians is not as much as, you know, UNPKs, Iskanders and stuff like that. That's the more classical attritional issue. The problem is that, okay, you are going to go there, but once you look at it more closely, the distance traveled roughly from Donetsk to um, the push currently in, in Bahmut is about 60 something kilometers. So once Konstantinovka becomes a real target, such as the Falls, you go to it, you get Konstantinovka. Then you gain a complete axis that goes from south, so basically from Avdivka towards uh, Konstantinovka, and from east, from Bahmut towards Konstantinovka. Konstantinovka, then at that moment, is definitely lost. One Pokrovsk falls, the direct link to Konstantinovka is severed. You have to go through it, you have to go through so many small cities 
as I said, you're gonna go through uh, Slovyansk, Kramatorsk, Druskovka, and then to Kostadinovka. So it's easier for the Russians to get at your ass from Bakhmut that for, for the Ukrainians first to get aid delivered in Slovyansk, then dispatch it for 35, 40 kilometers to Konstantinovka. This is the main problem, and this is why Pokrovsky is so important for the Ukrainians. And in a certain sense, they have already lost it, because right now there is still some trust going through. But the highway that we're speaking about, although it's open, the Ukrainians are doing their utmost to defeat the Russians in Berezivka and Bozvizhenka, it's still too close to the Russian um, drones and artillery to be fully passable. We've had uh, multiple discussions. They have said that the highway, the highway there is completely closed. We've seen, however, that it's still used by some Ukrainian units. So it makes it extremely complicated to tell you if it's working right now or not. It is working in the sense that um, there are complaints. We see videos uh, coming through and it, the most important part, the Ukrainians are absolutely defending that axis in order for them not to completely get a physical uh, cutoff. Then do we have the third part. So first part, as I said, it's simply the objective itself. Second part, it is the beyond objective. So basically you have this attrition plan and this attrition plan works not only for the objective, but works for the whole system of defense in Donbass. And basically also solves one, so one of the biggest um, political and military issues for, for Monkey, which is basically the point that he wants to make, which is Donbass. He has the worst issues of controlling it at a point that would be beyond what he controls in Zappo and what he controls in Kherson, where, where both are roughly 73 and 75 percent of the oblast. Both of these are also made more complicated because uh, um, Kherson and Zaporozhye have their uh, capital uh, cities halfway the river Dnipro. So basically Kherson is beyond the river Dnipro. Extremely complicated for uh, the Russians to achieve as, a, as an objective. And Zaporozhye is cut in half by the river. So in order to completely control both of these, there would have to be a change in the um, strategy and also options that the Russians have, which is basically they're going to have to find some way to cross the Dnipro and some way to hold at least half of Zaporozhye in order to force the Ukrainians to move completely back. Because this is one of the things that is bound to happen. It is, as I said, once you control Pokrovsk, you can uh, force the tempo on the Ukrainians, either go for Zaporozhye, either simply go for Dnipropetrovsk and force the Ukrainians to completely change their axis, because up to this moment, Dnipropetrovsk Oblast had never been breached in any meaningful way. The, the part with Krivoy Rog and Nikolaev was something different, and it was part of the expeditionary course that was beyond the uh, Dnipr uh, working in Kherson and Nikolaev Oblast. However, and this is our biggest problem, Right now, that option is a complete nonsense. That option being crossing the Dnipro and start to take over. And we know why. It's the best gift you can give the Ukrainians right now. Have a crossing, have the bridges for it. We're seeing it for smaller rivers, like the same in course. We saw that for the Dnipro uh, in Kherson in 2022. And probably going to see it with other uh, land obstacles in the future, especially as I believe the Russians are going to start pressing towards uh, Nikopetrovsk Oblast, simply to make the Ukrainians understand that this shit show is not stopping until they tap out. Right now, the Russians have more or less their objectives in mind. They have no problem with what's going on in course yet, in the sense that it's only been two and a half weeks, uh, sorry, three and a half weeks. Um, the Ukrainians are not making any headway. They keep going with their uh, tactics of the last week, which is uh, make a YOLO with an uh, armored vehicle or a map, hide it in the bushes and hope that the, uh, the Russians don't see you, and then wait for a second such position and try to advance to capture some other village in Bumfakistan, Kursk Oblast. 
The problem with that, as I said, is that most of the time, because the forces are so small, they pass through uh, holes, but then at some point they cannot exploit much, and they get uh, basically checked, get hit by artillery, and then we see the scenes that we're seeing more and more recently, which is a whole bunch of guys captured by the Russians and pirated, which is, in a certain sense, um, not so nice. We would like them uh, to not be available anymore at all for the Ukrainian armed forces, but unfortunately we are not uh, seeing that kind of uh, calculus yet in the eyes of the Russian leadership, because otherwise I probably would not have uh, to tell you this. The soldiers would have sold it themselves. Ha anyway, that's not the main problem. Back to Pokrovsk. Now, why Pokrovsk is even more complicated for Ukraine to lose than anything they've lost before. You know, for a long while we had Bahmut, and Bahmut was now Artemovsk. We had that area, and everybody was coping pretty hard by saying, you know, Bahmut, not strategic. He's not going to solve anything for the Russians. They're going to be stuck, and this and that. The problem with Bahmut is that by advancing there, it completely fortified the um, flank, the northeastern flank of the push that happened then to Avdivka. People who saw Bahmut happening in 2022, we're not speaking about 2023, more or less had this idea that there would be this huge pincer between Izium and Bahmut, and all the Donbass would be gone. The issue though, as I said, the Russians just didn't have it in them back there. Troops were not there, uh, front was too wide, um, people were not qualified enough. You had guys from the DNR and NR that literally were doing shit, and they were repelled pretty easily. Um, the Russians didn't understand uh, shit about how vulnerable their uh, temporary stocks were, and it happened. Ukrainians played it nicely, they wait for the long, wait, waited enough, went for the long hanging fruit, and did what, as, as I told you guys, instead of pushing hard for Zapo in 2022, when the Russians were still in this area, they, they could not defend it properly, there was no fortifications, nothing, they went for the easy uh, grabbing um, Kharkov, which made it extremely complicated, and that easy grabbing Kharkov left simply the Russians with the only option remaining, which was Zapo. While Kherson was being uh, fought over the river, they, they literally understood that, okay, Kharkov is gone, Kherson partially is gone, but they cannot cross the Dnipro because they don't have the means. Next step, well, easy peasy, would have been um, uh, Zaporozhye, because the battle for Bahmut was still ongoing. It, it was simple math, you know, minus one, minus one, plus one in the area around um, Bahmut. What remains? Well, basically, it remains. Either they would try something in Russia itself, or they would go for um, Zaporozhye. And then uh, what happened was pretty simple. Uh, Suro came by and said, you know, guy, we're going to stop whatever we're doing. We're going to fucking start dig trenches plant mines, point out uh, defensive positions, and then we're going to wait for them. For one more, re one more reason is that once you wait for these people, you also spare your own troops and you allow your old backbone and your muscle to form. So basically, this was, uh, the, both the mobilized and also people who were um, uh, contracted to serve as uh, soldiers. And the problem that happened is that the Ukrainians did exactly what everyone was expecting from them, and of, of course, as we told you uh, already by uh, early 2023, if some steps weren't taken, it would be a disaster, and it was a fucking shit show, they lost, their advance was extremely limited, you Russians were prepared, and all over the line, the, the feeling, I don't know, you were probably with me guys in June 2023, we were absolutely hilariously entertained by these guys doing everything wrong. And then seeing them do the exact same thing in course, but of course no defenders there and not enough preparation gives a, a severely different aspect. And indeed, that's what happened is that within a couple of days, 
they could have very well been to uh, Tokmak. But that's the difference between manning defense lines and not manning them and also turning a blind eye towards focusing in. Now back to uh, Pokrovs. Ukrainians at no point, I think, after what happened in 2022 and even 2023, uh, especially around October, they never thought that Pokrovs would come within 2024. And let's be honest, the two, three, four weeks uh, of the Avdika operation, and I said to you guys, that's the only way it's going to work. You are going with everything you got. You're going to fucking uh, smash the mouth of the guys in front. You're going to get a lot of punches, especially with the FPV. But you're going to establish yourself to a point where you have now the range to start engaging. And the only way for the Ukrainians to resist this was to pull back. It has nothing to do, I'm going to repeat it, it has nothing to do with Russians being extremely skilled or poor or whatever. No, it has to do with the fact that once you make your weight bare on the other side, you come close enough, there are just not enough of them after the first wave to stop you. So in order for them not to be completely swiped out, it's the logical thing they're going to do. They're slowly, slowly going to get pushed out. Avdivka was exactly that. Once enough troops, enough positions were taken by the Russians, the Ukrainians had only two choices, stay and die or run and die. And we all remember the article by the New York Times in this February, between 850 people and 1,000 people didn't make it out of Abdika. Even 500 would have been good enough, so I don't really care. Now, fast forward, month of April, May, Ocelotino happens, and... The problem with Ocelotino is, as I said, that it, he's, it's on this towering height in this dorsal that goes with the uh, railway through the whole Jelani Plateau passing through Pokrovs. Uh, and the problem with the Jelani Plateau is that once you access it, everything else is in, uh, close by reach, but the other side cannot resist to you. Because you're doing exactly as I said, you're going to make your way bare. You're going to push with all your might and for them once again to avoid getting crushed is pulling back. Also, one of the things that I said, given the disp discrepancy in forces, and it doesn't matter what Ukrainians say, they just don't have enough men to resist the Russians on a one-to-one -one basis. They can have the advantage of the defense, can they uh, have the advantage of the uh, contactless uh, means to fight, whatever. That doesn't really matter to the problem they have. The problem is that <clears throat> you're going to block 1, 2, 3, 20 tanks, but every time they're going to come closer, and every time <clears throat> they're going to start using their own FPVs on you, their artillery on you, their MLRs on you, and then you got your MPKs or whatever. So, you're going to start losing your first positions, but those first positions, and that, that was something that was also described by the themselves, they gave access to your whole defense system. So once the Russians were there, it was lost. It's the, exactly the same problem the Russians had when they were defending uh, combat positions in Robotina and Zaporizhia generally. The whole point was not to let the, the Ukrainians come close by. Because then you have to relocate. And once you relocate, you got hit on the back. For the Ukrainians, they are tasting a little bit of their own medicine that they inflicted on a couple of Russians in Zaporozhye. Because now the FPVs, despite being plenty, because that's one of the things that we're seeing, where are the FPVs in course? They are being mostly used uh, to attack tactical objectives. They are not anymore, of course, we've seen the motor combined, the, the harvester being attacked by FPVs, we've seen the ambulances, we've seen the cars. The terror aspect is going to still stay because Ukraine right now is into a uh, suicidal phase when they are going to do everything to inflict damage in order for <clears throat> Russia to relent. And that is the most dangerous part. As I said, the uh, full maximum pressure um, logic that everybody is pursuing right now, which I think is going to stop somewhere between December 2024 and January 2025, if the advance in Pokrovsk keeps going like this. Now the Ukrainians are not anymore rational actors, and that's the Kursk demonstrated this. It was a gamble, 
a gamble that would have worked, as I said, if the orbit for that gamble was different, if the equipment was different, if the logisticals were different, and if, most importantly, their air force could do something. We get back to the same problem that we had last year with the counter. They have something, but not enough, not in good form, and what they have is not employed properly. So the Air Force is attacking Tetkino because they cannot get closer. On top of it, the Russians are being extremely smart, given that the Air Force now is being used to do AD tasks, they send Shahids and voila, one retarded asshole burns his first F-16. Uh, we hope it's for, from Shahid, but probably it's going to be a friendly fire by uh, air defense. Doesn't matter. Morel. But the problem that we have now with the Ukrainian side is that given this logic of not letting Russians come close enough, otherwise they're going to crash you, they are being pulled back. There is this myth about um, a counterattack around uh, Berezivka, Vozvizhenka, from the Ukrainian army. But I say to everybody, and everybody knows already, attacking there would be the best gift you're going to do to the Russians. It's a choke point. It's the only high passage that you have from the highway down below to go up. And it's roughly 400 meters. A bunch of assholes with FPVs or guys with lances are going to ruin your life. Let alone um, Russian assets going in defense, RPGs, you having to, to cross through. And most importantly, you need to stage this somewhere. So you need to bring at least a, a battalion of armor and shit and stage them somewhere beyond the highway uh, at Berezivka. And there, there is nothing. And I'm I mean, just look at it. So we have Vozvizhenka and the closest main <clears throat> point when you can hide something because there are not even forests like they did with um, with Sumi and uh, um, and the uh, Kurs story. The closest you're going to have anything is going to be Dobropila itself. And it's already a mess because that's the funny part with the... Uh, <clears throat> with the Ukrainians. And this is one of the things that the, a, a journalist said when he compared the roads from Kursk Oblast to Sumy Oblast. They completely dilapidated their own Donbass area. Every border area since 2014 has been left to fucking rot. And it's normal, there is an open war. Russia is occupying land that Ukraine claims to be its own territory, and it's completely logical that they would do everything to make it less easy for the Russians to come through. So, infrastructure is going to be poor, um, the, the region, the area itself is going to be less invested upon. Aristovich himself said, Kharkov, whatever happens, is going to become a stub. It's going to be a cut hand towards Russia, point. So, the only way for them to start staging is going to be into the axis Dobropila, Rodinske, Bilitske, but the problem is then you have to uh, use the highway through Novekonomiste and Mal Malinivka. And there, you are less than three kilometers from the Russian positions right now. This means that you're not going to be able to deploy your full force, especially if the Russians bring up their FPV game. It's simply a matter of time for the Ukrainians. And it means that if they want to do a counter, it's going to happen right in next week or in two weeks. Otherwise, as I said, they're going to start installing themselves in Mirnograd. And once Mirnograd is done, then you need to force yourself to defend that city. And we've seen that the problem with a urban assault when you're a defender is that you need to plug all the holes. If the Russians pass only once at one spot, they risk getting in from behind and depleting whole blocks of the city and therefore creating bigger gaps for more Russians to come through. This is exactly what happened with uh, Novgorodivka, which was lightly defended 
the Ukrainians just pulled out. They lost three, four tanks and a couple of vehicles, and just they pulled out. It was not defendable, not defendable anymore. Russians had penetrated the city. They were moving left and right, and it was done. This used to happen with Mirnograd as well. But if that happens and the Russians consolidate there, then your possible highway to make a counter in Vozdvizhenka is gone. Because they are going to cut the highway right there if it is gone. Now, how the fuck Pokrov's being this important, it was left to rot. It wasn't left to rot. If you check the fortifications around Pokrov, they're actually quite good. The problem is that those fortifications should have been manned from people from Pokrov's. But instead, due to the cursed adventure, the troops that should have been actually defending and relenting the Russians from pushing towards Pokrovsk are not there. So the troops who are going to man the uh, trenches around Pokrovsk, the defense system, are most probably going to be the troops that are pulling back right now. They're going for a ha fucking hedgehog city. We are in the fullest larp of the Third Reich here. We had Kampf Gruber Piper in Kursk, we have Srinya Dead in Kursk, now we're gonna have a hedgehog city, a festum in Pokrovsk. It's the most hilarious thing ever. A Jewish president literally going full Hitler in its military practices. And funny thing is that it's exactly as a some guys within the, the group dubbed the Wachtam Schwein up in Kursk. It's going to be a Operation Festung somewhere around Pokrovsk and in Pokrovsk itself. Now, you're going to tell me that the Russians, if everything goes fine, by October they're going to be, start knocking the door of Pokrovsk. I'm going to tell you, yes, it would be a year uh, day to day and it will also allow the Russians to have a breather because right now there are only 10 kilometers. It doesn't seem that anyone is going to defend uh, the approach to Pokrovsk as hard as it should be defended. And we had a couple of yappers from the Ukrainians, from Tatagimi to <coughs> Stelnenko to uh, Bezluga. Anyway, doesn't matter. Everybody's saying that we need to change, Kursk is nice, but uh, pull it on ice, put it on ice and pull the troops to defend Pokrovsk. And I'm like, it would be the best thing ever because disengaging a couple of troops from Kursk would make them liable to getting hit on the back by moving out. On top of it, as I said, the only way to disengage and still keep some a foothold in course would be to start defensive preparations, start mining, start all that shit. By doing that, you're going to start exposing yourself. And it would make sense, actually, because the, the vegetation is there, so you can hide your firing points, you can do a, a kind of reverse robotino against uh, the Russians in, around Suja. But, as I already explained, for the Russians, it's not a problem. If you start having this logic of defending Suja against all odds, the Russians are just going to fucking start flying MPKs on the city. And a lot of people say, yeah, but the Russians do not want to bomb the city. They don't care because the, the thing they're going to do the most right now is inflict disproportionate, disproportionate losses to the Ukrainians. Meanwhile, to defend Pokrovsk, the Ukrainians are going to still go through the uh, inner city, probably use the train, because if you start driving about four to five hundred kilometers to the staging point, then uh, dispatch troops one after the other to defend Pokrovs. What's going to happen is pretty, pretty simple. Your defensive positions, they're going to have to be beyond the city, so in front of it. But if you have already lost Mirnograd, then your, your situation is you're going to have this, a fight between the sister cities, and also, the problem is that the highway A50 is still going to be under threat. You have to go completely behind Pokrovsk, which is basically doing already what the Russians want you to do. Take more time, uh, spend more fuel, um, be more visible, because that's a, also a thing. These guys are not going to start driving cross-country. It just doesn't make sense. They need to be efficient and be fast. So, railroad or highway? 
But if you're already 10 kilometers from Pokrovsk, or 8, or 7, doesn't matter, it means your FPV is going to cross the city and hit these guys trying to get inside. The only redeeming quality of Pokrovsk is the fact that it's not in the low plateau, like, like let's say, Konstantinovka or the sister cities. It's not as good uh, located as Avdivka, but because it's so wider than Avdivka, it's not like a ridge, and then once you're inside, it's done. There is some more meat to the uh, surface, to the uh, general uh, area of the city. Then you will need to do, as I said, instead of going head on by small groups, which could always work, is it has always worked for the Russians. You absolutely need to widen the front and force the Ukrainians to spend a lot more people trying to cover the flanks of the city. Exactly what they did in Bahmut. So Pokrovsk itself is a known quantity in the terms of how the Russians are going to do it. And the Ukrainians, if they don't do it within, as I said, this week or next week, they're going to have one big problem, and which is losing a complete nodule of transportation and logistical um, management of the, of the war, of the battle itself. Because Pokrov falls, you're going to go down to Ukraine, Ukraine's Kurakovo, Kurakovo Ugledar. You lose about 700, 780 square kilometers just by cutting that road, which is already cut between Ugledar and Konstantinovka. The biggest issue for the Ukrainians is to understand that if they defend Pokrovsk, they're going to lose Ugledar. If they don't defend Pokrovsk, they're going to lose Ugledar and also the upper northern salient. And in total, you are looking between 1,800 kilometers in the worst case scenario for the Russians, up to 2,600 kilometers in the best case scenario. It would be a complete front collapse. The Russians would advance swiftly about 20, 25 kilometers in depth through the whole facade, the eastern facade, from Ugledar uh, towards Pokrovsk. And once that is done, then you have the real problem for the Ukrainians. The front is Zaporozhye that was th that wide, that was between 140 and 160 kilometers, depending how you fucking want to deal with it. It's going to shrink to 100 kilometers. And as I already explained yesterday, that 100 kilometers contain a corner at Ugledar or Velika Novosilka, depending where the Russians are going to attack, where the forces can simply not get there because the depth would be about 20 to 30 kilometers that would put them in a certain sense in the kind of cold zone. So the reality of your stretch is not even 100 kilometers, it's going to be about 80. How the Ukrainians can counter this? Well, so far, the idea that Ribar had and the idea that other retards like uh, Peter Yalka was to make an attack in Vosvizhenka. I told you it's suicidal at this point if they have more people and if they accept to lose a lot of that people at the staging points because of UMPKs, standards, and so on. Good for them. We only want that. We only want Ukrainians to start spending troops that they don't have for a operation that we know is, is not going to succeed. At this point, if there's something else, maybe. If the uh, Martians come, uh, if the US intervenes or whatever, maybe it could succeed. But right now, there is no muscle. The second point, most important, is that by trying to have an attack around Zappo, a preemptive attack, a bit like what happened with Kursk, that's what the Ukrainians are saying. Your options are extremely limited. You have uh, Kamianske towards um, Nergodar. You have on the other side, just next to it, although I honestly think it's, it's retarded, but we're speaking about Ukraine here, so uh, there are no retarded ideas, there's just retarded executions according to them. So, you have Kamianske, then you have Piataki, and then the other possibility is between Orikiv and Shabaki, which would be <coughs> Nesterianka. The problem with Nesterianka is that it's a false plateau, basically, it's still going up for you. And it allows the, the Russians, because that's the funny thing, to have a, a wide um, distance between 
the uh, Dnieper bank, so from a potential uh, air defense attack on the flank from the west, and also a huge load of fucking land over right now 100 kilometers, but if the front comes to shrink from the east to west, then it's going to be another 70 kilometers. So basically, it's the perfect hunting ground for uh, the Louis Vuittons. Any kind of helicopter, even fucking new calves, are going to have a feast if the Ukrainians try to pass through there in order to uh, facilitate the push through Arkamyansk uh, towards Nevodar. And then there is the other problem. There is the defilade in Kamiansk. There's going to be a, a huge defilade um, in uh, Sherbaki towards uh, Nesteryanka. Then what? What are you going to do with this? Because the other problem is that in order to attack there, your main point, your main passage point, once that Pokrovsk is out, is going to be Zapo. But Zaporizhia itself is across the river. So it can facilitate the decision making of Monkey to cut the fucking bridges. If that happens, that would pose the biggest issue to the Ukrainians because every single other passage is going to be either by Kanik or going to be by Dnipropetrovsk. Passing through there adds another 100 kilometers of transit, but most important, this is the, the, the thing that we have. The Russians can fly to Dnipropetrovsk, they can see the bridges, so they can use this kind there as well. The Dnieper option for the Ukrainians is a shit show, but it is going to be the only one they're going to have if, once again, as I said, Pokrovs falls, because the risk is that from Pokrovs, the guys are going to put to deeper, push to Dnieper Petrovsk, and once they are into Dnieper Petrovsk, then you have another problem. After Pokrovsk, the next big city is quite far. So, our problem when you're Ukrainians is that once you don't have the propila, the next big agglomeration when you're going to put people, stage, whatever, is going to be Petropavivka, which is on a kind of same logic as, as, as Pokrovsk. It is into a, a nodule between uh, Petropavivka uh, <coughs> Uh, and the highway coming from Pavlograd itself. But it's 60 kilometers from Pokrovsk. It's easier and shorter to go from Donetsk to Pokrovsk right away, ignoring, as I said, the fact that they took memory in the highway that cuts through it, and they can start putting people either in uh, Novogrodivka, either in Grodivka, in Zelane. So the Russians, by taking the Zelane plateau, literally um, unlocked a huge logistical park. They can start parking shit all over the place. And they're going to force the Ukrainians to have to treat every single depot, every single point. And they have a straight highway to it. So defending the area, especially given it's in, in uh, the height, is completely self thinning for the Russians. You don't need to do much. You don't even... Act. This is an exaggeration. You don't even need to fortify because the Ukrainians have done most of the job. They just fucking scampered and left the fortifications on. It's a reverse of uh, Klishivka. So, for the Ukrainians right now, they have to decide. They let go of, of Pokrovsk, they let go of the war. At least the war as... Russia is fighting it right now. So basically, we take over the four oblasts. We grab some useless piece of land in Deeper Petrovsk. We kick off, of course, we keep about 3 to 7% of Kharkov Oblast. And, you, and we tell you, if you want to keep Dnieper, and if you want to keep Kharkov, you better just fucking sit, sign the paper, and give me my, what I need, and it's done. Now, there would be a lot of problems, as I said, because simply 20% of Kherson Oblast are not defensible within this logic, and the Ukrainians are never going to allow the Russians to completely start rebuilding, for instance, the Antonovka Bridge, 
start damming it, start defending it, putting a uh, state border in there, uh, mining it massively. Especially because even for the Russians, as we saw, it makes no sense to be there. Getting Kherson makes all the sense if you get also the nuclear level blast. So, accepting this current special military operation objective, as Putin said, basically, give me, uh, me my four blasts, I keep Crimea, uh, give me buffer zones between 60 and 300 kilometers, doesn't matter, because at the end, those buffer zones never work for Minsk, they're not going to work for, for this as well, especially because right now, the Ukrainians have made it clear that whatever they're going to sign, it is temporary, they're going to fucking renege them, they're going to go back to war. The whole point of this thing is to sign a paper for the Ukrainians in order in 10, 15 years to come back at it or fight the Russians to the point when it's going to be too expensive even for the Russians to agree to the, their own terms, which this is a stupid take uh, on the Ukrainian leadership, by the way. But this also means that for the Russians, the current borders are also very bad. And if there is a land swap, the land swap is going to be, we're going to push to Zaporozhye and then to uh, Dnipropetrovsk. And we're going to start taking over, basically, the Eastern Bank. There is nothing else to be done. You can, you can disagree with me. But if you want the territory that you just got from Ukraine to be defensible, you cannot stop at, at Kherson, or you cannot demand the uh, territorial boundaries of Kherson Oblast. Zaporozhye, it's not that bad. It's like 7-8% that are beyond the Dnieper. Who the fuck cares, I'd say. But Kherson is way too big. You just cannot leave that much space, especially as leaving Kherson makes it impossible for you to rebuild the bridge to have a passage on the other side. However, taking the other side means also that Russia at some point will have to go into a round three and take Nikolai Oblast. But once you got Nikolai Oblast, then there is a huge problem for the Ukrainians. Because you cross to Odessa, you cross to Yuzhne, and it's done. You lose the Black Sea. And this is never going to happen in the current format. Something will have to change. Like, Ukrainians would have to literally get slaughtered by the hundreds of thousands and be extremely weak for the Russians to waltz right in, grab the whole area, completely uh, liquidate the pocket around Yuzhne, go over, encircle Odessa, put their borders, make the link up with the PMR, and it's a done deal. It's, it's unfortunate, but everything points out that phase one of the military special military operation, whatever gives as a result for the Russians, so whatever of the four blasts they get, is not going to work like that if Putin wants to sign a normal territorial entity within Kherson and Zaporozhye, it means that the areas there are going always to be threatened by the Ukrainian forces. So either he's going to swallow the loss of about 16% of the territory he wants, which would also look, I'm not going to lie to you guys, which would also look pretty normal within a logic of um, negotiations. Okay, we left something, but you got something else. Uh, it's, it's not the worst. A lot of Gyrkinians here are probably going to fucking shit their pants and cry. But guys, that's why it makes, it makes it so different between team war criminal and everybody else out there in terms of Zegos. We see what's possible and we see what we can get. We're not always happy about that, but it's a lot better to have something and nothing. On top of it, as I said, if you're going to sign for the Oblast as they are, this means within 10 to 15 years, around three. There is no ifs, there's no buts. Because the moment the Ukrainians have enough strength to try and roll back people into Kherson, and they're going to do the exact same, same thing they did in Kursk, which literally costed the Russians between four and 500 uh, POWs. Now imagine how many more they're going to lose with a huge chunk of Kherson that is beyond the Dnieper. 
Plus, if they are well coordinated, they go as fast as they can, it's basically 35 to 40 kilometers, they can also catch your breath. The Russians just did that. The Russians did the, the contrary, which is, in my opinion, even worse. They traveled 80, 85 kilometers, got the bridge, pushed the Ukrainians back up to Nikolaev, and then happened what happened. They overextended themselves. So it's perfectly doable, especially as we've seen, sometimes the Russians are sucking their cocks. So, why did we discuss about this potential? Because Pokrovsk enables the Russians to have a second choice, as I told you. Instead of going for that fucking uh, garbage territory beyond the Dnieper, which is not garbage because it's Kherson city, it's, it's a Russian imperial city, then you just got, got there and grabbed Dnipro. After Zappo, you, got, you, you go and grab Dnipro, and it's fine. It's not Kherson, it's not Odessa, but it kills the Ukraine just the same. Yes, they're still going to have access to the Black Sea, unfortunately. But they're going to lose their industrial heartland for good. Donbass gone, Dnipro gone, and Kharkov, once Dnipro is gone, is in its own Kotel. And then you can go back and actually have a second, a third round, but instead of wasting your guys crossing the Dnieper, you just go for cargo. And then I'm gonna tell you something, if it really happens like that, then you have a huge problem because Kharkovites, for the Russian leadership, in my opinion, are the worst of the traitors. We're not speaking about Kherson, we're not speaking about Zappo, we're not speaking about Odessa, we speak about guys that literally are Russians, and they allowed, of course, they're part of Ukraine, but they allowed a, literally Western Ukrainians to impose them a vision. And of course, a lot of people are going to say, what are you saying? I mean, like, they have the right to a And that's not the point I'm saying. For, I'm speaking how the Russian leadership sees the Karkovites. And this makes it so much more complicated now, because once... Everything is cut clear, and it's just Kharkov standing there, and a huge part of the uh, Dnipropetrovsk Oblast is captured or controlled. Kharkov is gonna fucking feel it, and it's not gonna be a small incursion just to fucking distract the Ukrainians. It's going to be a shit show. And that I think is going to be the end of Ukraine as as we know it. But all this is going to happen because Ukrainians risk losing Pokrovsk, risk, risk losing the linchpin of the whole logistical system in southeastern Ukraine, as it stands now. Yes, you have Poltava, uh, yes, you have Pavlograd, yes, you have Dnipro, but Pokrovsk right there is at the crossroads of everything. The next cities, as I said, you are at 60 kilometers. You are having, start having huge gaps of highway bands going around. Literally, you have an, the, the nerve center of the southern Ukrainian defense that goes to shit. Then the problem with Pokrovsk, as I said, if you want to defend it, you're going to start leaving other directions. And with a surprise attack to um, the Kupiansk area with the taking of Sinkovka, the danger is that either you bring people back from Kursk, so you're going to lose the whole adventure there and everybody's going to fucking crucify you, which would be uh, not the first time for a G. Uh, but the other problem is that you're going to start losing Kupiansk. And once Kupiansk is lost, I already pointed the map, you're going to have this three-stage strategy, which is going to put a bunch of fuck, fuck wits into Kotel, and then the Ukrainians are completely down to that front as well. And suddenly the Russians are going to start creeping towards Izium. Once you are at Izium, you have a huge problem. Of course, this is not for this year, guys. Stop dreaming. I'm saying what the risk is. Because so far they're not so 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 much far away from Kupiansk. It should have been for a while now. But 
if you have the domino effect in Kupiansk, then the whole fucking Oski line risk completely falling. And then the Russians can pressure there instead of pressuring in Kursk or instead of pressuring in Siversk or instead of pressuring in, even in Pokrovsk. The whole Russian strategy, the whole grasping of strategy since they got butt fucked in 2022 is to make sure that the pressure is always constant on the Ukrainians so they cannot stop, think about themselves and do something. And the only places where the Russians stopped really doing anything, which was turning off Sumi, they got it in the ass with the Kursk offensive. The whole strategy of pressure that the Russians had on, on most of the uh, contact line right now is what is allowing them to make the run the Ukrainians like fucking headless chicken. And also make this fucking stupid decision that we're going to fucking attack Kursk with troops that we need for Pokrovsk or elsewhere. On top of it, one of the things that is starting to appear, I, I already posted the interview um, of Zelensky when Zelensky literally lies in public. And this is, you know, Ukrainians, Ukrainian officials lie a lot. That's not a, something new. We, knew, we know about that. I, I even coined, actually I didn't coin, it was someone else into a, another form that coined. Well, how do you know that troops lie? They breathe. But the problem with Zelensky is that for most of the time, he maintained this facade of I'm saying things that are, if not if they're not true, we're going to fucking plausibly deny them. What he said, that since Kursk, the advance of the Russian forces that stalled or uh, was slower, is something that everybody in the motherfucking same room as him knew was, was not true. And in a sense, that's the moment where Zelensky cannot tell anything about Putin anymore. And that's nothing to do with legitimacy or legitimacy. It doesn't matter. It just shows that when put into the same pressure box, Zelensky is not the leader. He's not. At, at a certain point, the whole thing for Zelensky in this war is to be a fucking beggar and try to convince everybody that they're going to do it right and they're going to fucking succeed at everything. The pressure that Zelensky has is indeed that they're fighting Russia, which is a, a huge pressure. But a lot of the problems that Zelensky doesn't need to face, like Putin, who has now a factor of sanction, need to find a way to pay the Chinese, the Turks, for their, their um, imports, needs to find a way not to lose the pipeline towards Europe. The level of pressure that is on, on Monkey is so much higher than the fucking comedian. And still, what Putin does mostly, and he lies, guys, I like, sometimes when he gives the numbers of the Ministry of Defense of Russian Federation, I'm, I'm, I'm crying. Because it makes no sense to say those numbers. I understand why they do it because Ukrainians started with all this bullshit. We killed 5,000 Russians and we destroyed 300 tanks per day. I get the point. I get where the Russians want to go with it. It just doesn't, it's not logical. It makes no sense. It reads that literally German OKV reports on tanks destroyed. But Zelensky had this aura about being quote-unquote truthful, and there he lied openly. And I think that's another problem of what I said yesterday. Ukrainians have made all this whole PR, PR game that is huge, but at the same time, they are fucking faulting because of that PR. They are trying to do something they're not supposed to do. They are not supposed to blatantly lie to their allies. Because that, you know, press pool there, it didn't have only Ukrainians. That's a public statement that is also for public consumption that you're going to present to your allies. You can have what Sirsky did, that he presented the numbers, and the numbers were pretty bad. And I mean, like, 
you have in average like 85% of interceptions and the system comes by and says, you know what, maybe we intercept 40, 30, 20%. And that thing belies everything else. But it's not a problem because, you know, it's, it's war and whatever. But Zelensky going on air and saying something that's stupid is like Gerasimov, or in this case, Putin, saying that we, still, we are still holding uh, Kherson city. We are to that point. So, the main issue now for the Ukrainians is to make a decision a bit like the Russians did in uh, November, actually October 2022. Pokrovsk is not lost yet. It's a matter of time, true. But until Pokrovsk is, isn't lost, it, until Pokrovsk doesn't have a Russian flag flying on top of it, it's not lost. And this is, in my sense, in my, in my optics, where the Russians should be extremely careful and take it out. No pussyfooting, no trying to, you know, even if Kursk is evacuated by the, uh, the speeders, it doesn't matter. Kursk is still going to be a failure for the Ukrainian forces because of our, what I explained. Orbat not good, uh, complete unevenness of, of the quality of the troops. Uh, the fact that they left everybody do more or less what they thought, uh, the slowness or understanding that I had failed with the first wave of assault, and the, then to bring out the other uh, type of troops and reserves that we saw by week three and a half. The issue here for Pokrovsk is that Russians need to take it. You take Pokrovsk on top of the strategic and tactical value of the target, the PR coup is absolutely fundamental because you definitely smash the backbone of the Ukrainian gamble, which was all oh, trying to change the narrative that Ukraine is losing and we can still hold our own and force Russians to the negotiation table. Pokrov gets lost. You have a fucking Queen Eagle flag on top of that motherfucking city. I explain more or less what's going to happen and why it's so complicated. How how why the Ukrainians cannot lose the city? But if you lose it, what you gonna what are you gonna lose over the top? Is the trust, whatever trust is remaining within NATO and everybody else, especially the military um, establishment, who is going to see that you took a gamble? It was a shit show, and you just fucking lost the most important piece of your logistical system. And now, instead of starting the fucking counter, I don't know, at Ocelitino or uh, just slightly beyond Avdivka, you have to start your fucking fight somewhere around Dobropila, trying to push the Russians back. Don't forget, that means that you're gonna have to make about 50 to 60 kilometers to push the Russians back in the strongest direction they have. And if you lose the whole fucking southern line to Azugledar, then you cannot counter in Zaporozhye anymore in, in the whole safety bubble that you had last year. You literally lose the SMO right there. It's done. Your only chance is hoping that the Russians are tired enough that they don't push the deeper Petrovsk blast. But as I see now, the Russians are going to press their advantage as much as they can. And this makes Russia extremely dangerous right now for Ukraine. It's not that much that they are so much better than uh, two years before, a year before. No, it is Ukraine that's a lot worse. And it's not supposed to be, my God, F-16, my God, Abrams, my God, Leopard 2, my God, 155. Howitzers, self-propelled howitzers. My God, Atacams. My God, Heimars. My God, maybe who knows? So, Jasm, whatever. The incremental introduction of this weaponry in the battlefield 
without streamlining the logistics and re-equipping the Ukrainian army with equivalent equipment, so basically Western equipment, makes, and I told you this over a year before, makes the value added by those systems useless. It makes it actually even worse because suddenly you have only a bunch of little parts that are not good enough anyway because the FPV is going to fuck them over like they fuck a T90M or a T64. Yes, maybe they're going to take a little bit more time to get blown up, which is not even true now, we know. You're going to cop cage that motherfucker or you're going to lose it right away. But the the whole point here is just to go back and tell you guys, the whole point here is that Ukraine Pokrov is losing, is going to lose a lot more than a city and even a lot more than an oblast. Ukraine Pokrov is going to lose its current strategic layout. Because until now it was fine, it was just Donbass. Russians in Kharkov, bah, 7%, 6%, who the fuck cares? At some point, the Russians were going to pull back anyway because they don't want Kharkov. They didn't say, we want Kharkov. Putin didn't require it. But suddenly, if those motherfuckers cross into Dnipropetrovsk, if the monkeys go to Dnipro, given how the, the whole fucking uh, oblast is laid out, to stop them, you're going to have to put up a fucking good show. And if you lose Pokrovsk, you allow the motherfucking UMPKs to fly 40 kilometers within at least. 40 kilometers from Pokrovsk means that any kind of small village, just open the map, there is nothing big. That means that everything you're going to start to stage around the area is going to get blown within one to two months. you got small specks of fucking land then your whole fucking logistical axis is going to be Pavlograd and Zaporozhye. One is at 110 kilometers. And the other is, well, at 30-something. And it's getting visited more or less every two weeks, every month by uh, East Kander and friends. So your problem now is simple. You cannot lose Pokrovsk. You lose it. You start a completely different war. Pokrovsk was your point of defense of the whole area around Ocheretino. Pokrovsk was the only answer, in a certain sense, to the proximity of the front line with Donetsk. And Donetsk guaranteed the Russians a strong, large, huge logistical point. Actually, attacking Donetsk for the Ukrainians was losing the war, just on the losses alone. The Russians, at the worst scenario, would have let the, the Ukrainians try to get the city lose probably 20 to 20 to 30,000 killed just to get to some point within the city, then counterattack them from the south and clear them out. This is why the Ukrainians at no point wanted to have anything to do with Donetsk. This is why the Donbass, in a certain sense, was already lost for them once you start to make the math. The whole point was to have the Russians defeated in other areas so they couldn't hold the whole front line. And then you can start is isolating them and then you can start this discussion that I'm going to fucking attack Crimea if you don't get out from uh, Donetsk Oblast. And unfortunately, it didn't work for Ukrainians because honestly, it would have made it a lot more interesting as a war right now. Right now, we are into a phase where a lot of people are yapping about how Ukraine this, Ukraine that, about this uh, fuel depot going up, about this uh, ferry getting blown up. And I'm like, who the fuck actually even cares? Your problem is that right now the Russians are cramming 
more supplies to the ground uh, bridge, the land bridge from um, Donetsk to uh, Crimea than they ever did through the fucking bridge and to the fucking ferries. So your problem is that you cannot stop them. And therefore they're gonna keep fucking the shit out of you. The only way for Ukrainians to win right now is literally, as I said, to have the Russians start pulling out completely beyond uh, the area that is under the um, shadow of uh, Donetsk city. The problem with that is that the shadow of Donetsk city now is going to be complemented by Pokrov. It's going to be complemented by three, four highways that go all to Pokrovsk. And the city can even fucking be empty. It doesn't matter. It can be a huge fucking base for 30, 40,000 soldiers, which are going to start pushing either on the flanks, either straight ahead. And there, as I told you, between Pokrovsk and Peshotravensky, it's 60 kilometers, 55. So all the small areas are going to fall to the Russians simply because the supplies and the support from behind is going to be shit. And by advancing also by the south, so by pushing from Ugledar up, they're going to narrow the front line on that corner so badly that the efforts that you are currently putting into trying to defend Kharkov are going to be forced to be transferred into Dnipro Petrovsk. Well, the front shrinks and you do not have any um, national features to stop the Russians. You don't have huge lakes. The only thing you're going to have is Dnipro and then you have the um, uh, small passage of the irrigation lakes. Uh, I want to tell you exactly because that's uh, where the Russians are probably going to stop. So you're going to have Pokrovsk. And the Russians are, not, are going to push. Are going to try and push as fast as they can. Uh, you have Peshtravensk, and then you have the first line in Oleksandrivka, which is about 50 kilometers at the Samara River. So, at the Samara River, the problem is that you are exactly 20 kilometers from Barvinkovo. And 20 kilometers from Barvinkovo is the gateway to go to Izium. So the Russians, from there on, they don't even need to try and attack Dnipropetrovsk. They just can make a huge link up, which is just next to the actual highway, uh, Dobropila Alexandrivka. And then you are into a fucking shit show. Especially as the Russians advance from Konstantinovka towards Kramatorsk and advance the front line. All this domino effect might happen only by losing Pokrovs. And people are going to say, yeah, but how long? How much? How many people are going to die? And I'm like, I do not think that Ukrainians are going to have the, the strength to start explaining to the Allies that their mobilization has gone to shit because suddenly the Russians have positions that first are not defendable by the Ukrainians, but they are way too far within Ukraine. And the front line now for the Ukrainians is starting to stretch. And the logistical chain is getting smaller for the Russians, but wider for the Ukrainians. Up to a point where they're going to have this balance, as I said, because Izium, from Izium and behind, you have a huge problem because you are in Kharkov uh, Oblast, where the highway, the road network, is a lot more dense than between, and I, I'm telling you guys, just look between Lozova and Pokrovsk, you have 90 kilometers that's empty. You don't have major highways. You're going to have some small roads, which are going to be used probably to link up Ukrainians, but you don't have, you'll get a huge fucking gap there. Whereas in Izium, 
every 20 kilometers you have an interchange and of course you have a uh, terrain feature that stop the Russians from being that effective. And we actually always saw what, what happened. The Russians needed to force themselves through many uh, a, a trap, many an ambush in order to get this zoom. And then finally they still lost this zoom at the end. So the whole point for the Russians now is going south, north, and east to west. And it's going to be the, the most problematic aspect of the loss of Pokrovs. Thank you very much, guys. If you want to ask questions, uh, it's going to be short, about 10 minutes. Uh, otherwise, yeah, uh, we are done with the, we are done with the, the space today. Up to you guys. Well, it seems that nobody wants to uh, add something else. It's up to you guys. I um, This was uh, one of the spaces, uh, one of the last spaces, uh, because I think that I'm going to uh, cut a, li a little bit back uh, on the um, layout for personal reasons. And I hope uh, that we see each other within two to three weeks for another space. But that's why I, I uh, wanted to make another one right now. Okay, no add-ons. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, it was a pleasure. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, it's going to be shorter than two weeks. But yeah, I think at min a minimum two to three weeks without spaces. Uh, I will still be on Twitter. I'm going to still have uh, at least one thread over the problematic attack of Krovsk without Mirnograd and also the problematic uh, logistical issue for the Ukrainians uh, when it comes to um, the loss of Pokrovsk. Thank you very much. Have a nice day, guys.